So none of this tells us exactly really what play is. This is about play, how children play, and so on and so forth. So what is play? I've given a lot of thought to this. I've read the definitions that various scholars have given over the years and decades uh, and added my own thoughts. I've even taken into account um, uh, what kindergarten kids uh, say is play and how they identify play. Uh, and I've developed this theory, this four, actually five part, the way I've written out here, five part definition of play. So I would argue that an activity is play to the degree that it has all five of the characteristics fully represented, which I've listed here. And now I want to run through those characteristics. I should say that an activity could be more or less playful. It doesn't have to be fully play to the degree that some of these characteristics are in partly there. To that degree, it is a playful activity. So the first and most important part of the definition is that play is self-chosen and self-directed. Self-chosen and self-directed. So if a teacher stands up in front of a classroom and says, now children, we're all going to play this, it's not play. Play is what the children themselves decide to do. It may be fun. It may be worth doing. I'm not necessarily against that, but it's not play. It's a perversion of play to call that play. Play is self-directed, self-chosen. Self it's, play is how children learn to choose their own activities, how children learn to design their own activities, how children learn to carry out their own activities. As soon as an adult is involved in doing that for children, you are taking away one of the major evolutionary purposes of play, which is for children to learn how to do that themselves. So that's the first characteristic of play. And notice that I said that play is self-chosen and self-directed, but I also said that play is usually social. Children are playing together. So what does that mean? That means that the play children, two or more children playing together, all have to agree on what they're playing and how they're playing. And if you've ever watched children play, you realize that there's oftentimes more negotiation going on than there is actual play. And that's a good thing, because this is how children learn to negotiate. This is how children learn to get their needs met while also meeting the needs of others. It's how they learn to compromise. I want to play this. You want to play that. I don't want to play that, but how about this? And we end up coming to something that we both want to play. And I want to play it this way, but, and you don't want to play it that way. And I insist on playing it this way. And you say, I hear my mom calling. I'm going home. And I say, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I will play it your way. So we, we are learning. The, the, and notice that I said the thing that gets me is that you, you threaten to quit. And maybe you will quit. The freedom to quit is the most important freedom in play. It's that freedom to quit that makes play the most democratic activity there is. If you can't quit, I can bully you. But I can't bully you if you can quit. If you can just leave any time, I can't bully you. And so I have to learn how to, how to play in a way that makes you happy as well as me happy. Most important lesson anybody can can possibly learn. If you can't learn that, if you can't do that, you can't have a good marriage. You can't have real friends. You can't have good work partners. You can't really cooperate with other people. This is, we are by nature a social animal. And so this is, I would argue, the most important skill that children learn in play. And they only learn it when there's not an adult involved. Because if there's an adult involved, the adult tries to solve the problem. The adult becomes a source for tattling by one child to the other, to, about the other, and so on and so forth. They are not left to solve their problems themselves. And it is the solving of those problems yourself. By trial and error, somebody does leave me. I'm left alone. Nobody wants to play with me. I've got to figure this out. I might consult with somebody. An adult role is OK there. I might talk to a parent. Nobody wants to play with me. And they'll say, well, maybe you're... Maybe you're bullying. <laughs> you know, that's OK, but not for the adult to be there solving it in the immediate time. So uh, the third, second characteristic of play is that it's intrinsically motivated. I could go on forever about the value of this, but let me just say this. Intrinsically motivated means you're doing it because it's fun. You're doing it because you love to do it. 
You're not doing it for some trophy. You're not doing it to improve your resume. You're not doing it to get an A. You're not doing it to get praise from your parents or anybody else. You're just doing it because you want to do it. You know how almost every commencement speaker says to the new graduates, follow your passions. It's almost cruel. How would you know what your passions are if all you've been doing is school, right? If all you've been doing is stuff that you're told to do. Where do you discover passions? It's in play. Play is following your passions. Play is how you discover your passions. If we take play away from children, how can we possibly expect them to figure out what they like to do? What you like to do is play, <laughs> and play is what you like to do. If we want people to develop passions, we have to give them lots of time to play. Lots of time to play, not just an hour a day or two hours a day. This is, I'm convinced, why it is that so many of those Sudbury Valley graduates have careers that really are following their passions. They had time and opportunity to develop interests in childhood, and they're very often going on following those interests in adulthood in their careers. Third characteristic of play is that it is guided by mental rules. This is not intuitively obvious. This, is, this um, seems a little counterintuitive to some people because we think of, I said that play is free. Play is freely chosen, but it is not free form. And it, th this is an interesting paradox of play. Children freely choose, when they choose to play, to put themselves into a situation where they're no longer free except they are free to quit. <laughs> but as long as they are in the play, they are limiting their own freedom. There are only certain things you can do in the course of play. And those things are guided by mental rules about what it is you're supposed to do. So in some cases, the rules are very clear. Those are games with formal rules, whether it's you know, uh, candy land or chess or baseball or whatever it is. The rules are stated and fairly explicit. But every kind of play has at least implicit rules. And these implicit rules will be stated if somebody violates them. So imagine what might look like the wildest kind of play. A couple of boys chasing one another around, throwing one another, wrestling, uh, acting just absolutely wild. Something that we would call a play fight. And in school would be stopped because the teachers would confuse it with real fighting. When in fact, play fighting is actually the opposite of real fighting. But, the, uh, but think of the rules that are involved in that. No, they, they may not be stated, but no kicking, no biting, no really hurting the other person, no hitting hard. If you are the, old, if you are the bigger of the two, you have to self-handicap in some way. Otherwise, it's no fun. If you're going to throw somebody, you throw them on a pile of leaves or on a pillow or something soft or at least on grass. If anybody violates one of these rules, the other one will surely say it. Hey, no, no kicking, right? The other one will surely say it. That play fight is an exercise in restraint. That's what makes it opposite from a real fight. A real fight, if a real fight, you use any means possible to subdue the other person. That's the difference between a real fight and a play fight is the play fight has rules and the real fight doesn't. And I could make the case for every form of play that there are rules. And play is how children learn to do structured things. You know, we sometimes mistakenly talk about unstructured play. There's no such thing as unstructured play. Play is always structured, and it's always structured by the children themselves. If it's structured by an adult, it's not play. And if it's not structured, it's not play. So play is always structured, and it's always structured by the children themselves. There's no such thing as unstructured play. Play is never random activity. That's the uh, third characteristic. The play fourth characteristic of play is play always involves at least some element of imagination. There's some sense in play in which the players recognize that they are stepping outside of the real world. This is most obvious in the kind of fantasy play that especially little children, three, four, five-year-olds, engage in a great deal, playing house, playing superheroes. They're imagining themselves to be characters that they're not. 
And the rule of that play is you have to stand character. If you're the pet dog, you have to act like a dog, no matter how much you want to get up on your hind legs rather than walk around on all fours, no matter how much you want to talk rather than go around arf, 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 all the time. But the fact is, if you're the pet dog, no matter how uncomfortable it is, you have to act like the pet dog until you say, I'm not going to be the pet dog anymore. I have to be something else, or, I'm, or my mom is calling me. So that's the... <laughs> That's, the, um, that's the, the, the sort of two sides of the rules and the uh, imaginative component of that kind of play. But that play fight, that's also, you know, that's an imaginary fight. It's not a real fight. Kids make an, in constructive play. They're building a sandcastle on the, on the beach. They know they're not building a real castle. They're building an imaginary castle, a play castle, and so on and so forth. They could run through every instance of anything that you would want to call play and talk about where the imaginative component is to that. So then, um, so in play, as I said before, children are exercising what really is the highest order way of human thinking, what's called hypothetical deductive thinking, the ability to think about things that aren't there and to think logically about things that aren't there. And watch even little children playing an imaginary game and they are, they're imagining that, you know, they're so, they're, so there's a troll under the bridge and what does that mean? What are the implications of there being a troll under the bridge? They may not say it that way, but essentially that's what they're doing in their play. They're doing exactly what a scientist is doing. When a scientist think, says, all right, let's suppose this hypothesis is true, then what else has to be true? They're thinking all that through, through. The fifth characteristic of play is that it is conducted in a, uh, an alert, active, but non-stressed frame of mind. And this is a frame of mind that many researchers refer to as flow. The mind is active, the mind is totally involved and immersed in this activity. But the mind, and there may be some degree of stress involved, but not too much, not too much. And the reason that really this characteristic of play follows from all the others. You can't be passive in play because there are these rules you have to follow. You have to be attentive to it. You're paying attention to means. You have to do certain kinds of things. It's impossible to be passive in play. The mind is always active in play. But secondly, the mind is not overly stressed because after all, this is just an imaginary world. So if you fail, so what? Nothing bad happens. You're not being evaluated. There's no trophy on the line. No parents are going to be disappointed if you don't succeed. You're not going to, nobody's going to threaten that you are not going to get into college. <laughs> Nobody, if you fail at this, you're free to fail. That's the key. That's why the playful state is such a wonderful state of mind for doing creative things, for doing new things, for learning new things, for trying out new things, because it doesn't count. The, the paradox of play that I like most to repeat is that play is trivial. Play is absolutely trivial. It doesn't count for anything. You don't get anything from play. You don't get food. You don't get rewards. You don't get... Um, you, you don't improve your resume. It doesn't count. It's trivial. But it's, it is precisely because it's trivial that it is such a profound vehicle for learning. Because it's trivial, because it doesn't count, because it's not getting you anything, you're free to try new things. You're free to do things in new ways. You're free to try things you wouldn't dare try in the serious world where where it would matter if you failed. We try to teach children in schools where the threat of failure is the primary motivator, is the primary motivator. What could be a worse motivator for learning new things than the threat of failure? The time to learn new things is when you are in a playful state of mind where it doesn't matter if you fail and therefore you can try Therefore, you could put some effort into this and see, challenge yourself with it. So I'm going to conclude with that. And um, thank you very, very much for coming out, for attending to this talk. And I really hope that all of you will do whatever you can to bring play back to children's lives in this culture, however you can do it. We we declared uh, about a century ago that child labor is 
unreasonable that children should not be subjected to full-time child labor, and so we created child labor laws. But we have now put children into a sedentary kind of workplace, school, where they are in many cases spending more hours than their parents are at work at a kind of job that none of you would be willing to accept, no matter what you were paid for it. So we've got to change this in our culture, and I urge you to play whatever role you can. Thank you very, very much.